Aging and disease are biochemical processes that happen over many decades. So if we track and optimize well-established biomarkers of organ and systemic health, can aging and disease risk be slowed? So apologies if you've heard that a billion times, but for people that are new to the channel, that's the central premise of the YouTube channel. So with that in mind, earlier this week, I blood tested for the seventh time in 2023. So what's my biological age? And we'll see that data here. This is using Dr. Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator as a metric of biological age. And if you have blood test data and want to calculate your own biological age using this test, that link, it's a free downloadable link. Uh, it's an Excel file, so you can use it anytime. It will be in the video's description. So when entering the nine component biomarkers and chronological age for this test, I get a biological age of 35.6 years, which is 15.2 years younger than my chronological. Now note that for the 14th consecutive test, Quest, so the lab that I used, their high sensitivity C-reactive protein measurement was less than 0.3 milligrams per liter. So that's their upper limit of detection. They can't detect below that. So CRP could indeed be below 0.3 milligrams per liter, but not higher. So in other words, the biological age of 35.6 years could be a little bit less because CRP could, could be less than 0.3 milligrams per liter. And rather than looking at data entered into a spreadsheet, screenshots of the lab report will be included later in the video. Now, note that this is just one test, uh, and it's important to not just focus on one test year to year because does that truly represent changes year over year? So for more context, let's have a look at biological age results since 2018, as I now have 29 blood tests over that period. And that's what we can see here. So in 2018 to 2019, I only have three tests with an average age of 36.1 years. And then I tested 12 times, six each year in 2020 and 2021, with an average Levine age uh, or phenotypic age, biological age of 35.6 years. I was able to reduce that in 2022 to 33.8 years. And note that I had videos on the channel for each of the tests over the past few years. So if you missed that, they'll be in playlists on the channel. So 33.8 year average in 2022. And then for the seven tests in 2023, it was a bit worse than 2022 at 34.7 years, but still better than the 35.6 from 2020 to 2021. Now, rather than looking at year to year averages, we can compare by two sample t-tests whether differences between these groups of data, 2020 to 2021 versus the last 14 tests are significantly different. And when I do that, or when I did that using a two sample t-test, uh, the 12 tests with an average age of 35.6 years was significantly higher than the last uh, 14 tests from 2020 to 2020, 2022 to 2023. So in other words, I've been able to significantly reduce it over the past 14 tests relative to the 12 tests in 2020 to 2021. So how good is this test? I haven't yet introduced that, and it's been a while since I've shown that data on the channel, although there are older videos that have included it. So how good or not is this test, PhenoAge, for uh, chronological age. So to first assess that, let's take a look at phenoage. Again, this is a metric of biological age. How good is its correlation with chronological age? And that's what we can see here. On the y-axis, we've got phenotypic age. Again, this is the metric of biological age using Levine's test, plotted against chronological age on the x-axis from the 20 to 90 year age range. And these data were generated using the NHANES-4 study, which included more than 11,000 people. So in terms of the correlation, we can see that it's almost perfectly linear with a correlation coefficient of 0.96. Note that for a positive correlation, a correlation, correlation coefficient of 1.0 is perfectly linear. So that the Levine test has a correlation coefficient of 0.96 is very strong and close to as good as it can get. Now, in a second study using the NHANES-3 cohort, which included more than 9,900 people, the Levine test had a similar strong correlation with chronological age of 0.94. In other words, Levine's test, this phenoage test, again, as a metric of biological age, is strongly correlated with chronological age. So to put this uh, 0.94 to 0.96 into perspective, this is as good as the best epigenetic clock, which is the Horvath clock, for predicting chronological age. And if you missed the Horvath clock data, I presented that in a video last week, including nine blood tests so far for my own data. So if you missed it, it'll be in the right corner. Check it out. All right, so what about all-cause mortality risk? How something is associated with age is part of the story, is, is, is indeed part of the story, but how does it relate to uh, risk of death from all causes, all-cause mortality risk? And that's what we can see here. 
So for every one year increase in FINA wage, that's associated with a significant 9% increase for risk of death for all causes. Now, what about cause-specific mortality? Because all-cause mortality breaks down into cause-specific mortality, including CVD, cardiovascular disease. So we can see that for a one-year FINA wage increase, that's associated with a 10% higher risk of death from cardiovascular disease. Similarly, a 7% increase in cancer mortality. It's not associated with Alzheimer's disease-related mortality, a 20% increase for diabetes-related mortality, and a 9% increase for chronic lower respiratory diseases. And note that the p-value for each of these associations on the right are all less than 0.05. So phenoage, Levine's test for me measuring biological age, is significantly associated with all-cause mortality risk and many cause-specific mortalities. Again, p-value is less than 0.05 with the exception of the Alzheimer's disease-related mortality. Now, this isn't the only biological age metric that I use. I also use aging.ai, so let's take a look at that data. So aging.ai is also free to use, and again, I'm not affiliated or sponsored with Morgan Levine or aging.ai. These are just easy, free uh, tools that I use that are, that are actually good in terms of their correlation with chronological age and their association with all-cause mortality risk, which is why I use them. So how good or not is aging.ai, just like we evaluated Levine's test, phenoage. So in terms of its correlation with chronological age, it's not as strong, 0.80, but still that's considered a strong correlation as higher than 0.7 is considered strong. What about all-cause mortality risk, which is what we can see here. So in this study, and note that all of the papers in the video will be in the video's description. So if you want to check it out, it'll be in the video's description. So for people that had a at least an at least five-year younger biological age using aging.ai compared to their chronological age, they had a significantly reduced all-cause mortality risk as shown by that green rectangle as its 95% confidence interval, that's the horizontal line on both sides of that square, is completely to the left of the hazard ratio of one. Conversely, for people who had a five-year older aging.ai age relative to their chronological age, they had a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. As you can see that the 95% confidence interval is completely to the right of a hazard ratio of one. So aging.ai, just like phenoage, is strongly correlated with chronological age and is significantly associated with all-cause mortality risk, thereby hi highlighting their usefulness and uh, potential efficacy in uh, uh, predicting age and potentially mortality risk. So with that in mind, what's my biological age using aging.ai? So when entering its 19 component biomarkers as shown here, and I use the North Amer American data set for anyone who wants to double check the numbers, uh, I get an aging.ai age for this test of 30 years, which is 20.8 years younger than my chronological. But note, this is just one test. So just like we did for Levine's test, for more context, let's have a look at previous aging.ai data. And that's what we'll see here. So I have 44 tests dating back to 2009. But when I first started measuring in 2009, it was at most once a year. As you can see that there are three blood tests uh, from 2009 to 2013. Nonetheless, over those three tests, my average aging.ai age was 32 years. And then in 2016, I, I decided to start testing more often to get a more accurate representation of year-to-year -year changes, testing 34 times over that seven-year period from 2016 to 2022, with an average aging.ai aging age of 29.8 years. All right, so what about 2023? So for the seven tests in 2023, including the most recent test with 30 years old, my average aging.ai age was 30 years old. So what we can see from these data is that over the last eight years, my aging.ai age is stable at an average age of 30 years. So it hasn't increased or it hasn't decreased either. So potentially good news, especially, you know, as we know, my stated goal is to live longer than anyone that's ever lived. And to do that, I'd expect to be able to maintain biomarkers of many organ systems as close to flat as I can for an indefinite period of time. How long I can do that, we'll see, but I'll be detailing it with videos for the next 70 plus years on the channel, so stay tuned. So at this point in the video, I usually say what may be contributing to these biological age reductions, including diet and or supplements. And in the interest of time, note that this is still a side job. If you want to see that change, make sure you like and, and you know share and all that good social media jazz to support the video. So I'll have the time to show that data in next week's video, uh, exactly a week from today. But for now, let's dig into the full blood test report as I'd like to highlight some strengths and some weaknesses. So first, let's take a look at my HDL, which was 56. I've shown in earlier videos that 
uh, HDL in the 50 to 60 range is associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk in very large epidemiological studies. But getting HDL greater than 50 has been a challenge until relatively recently. More specifically, for the last five tests, my HDL has been greater than or equal to 50 milligrams per deciliter, whereas for the 43 or so tests before that since 2015, it was an average of 45 milligrams per deciliter. So I've made progress on getting HDL into that quote-unquote optimal range, and I'll detail that progress in an upcoming video uh, relatively soon. So many videos to make, though. All right, and then we can see the HR, uh, HSCRP at less than 0.3 milligrams per liter. Glucose is at the bottom of the page. And then moving forward to highlight a potential weakness, it would be creatinine as a marker of kidney function. So creatinine levels increase during aging, in part because kidney function gets uh, worse at removing it from the blood. Now, for the last five tests, my average creatinine level has been 1.01 milligrams per deciliter. In contrast, over the previous 43 tests since 20, 2015, it was 0.95 milligrams per deciliter. Now, that may not seem like a big difference. Statistically, using a two-sample t-test, you can see the p-value is less than 0.05. So they are significantly different. But knowing that creatinine levels increase during aging and seeing that I do have a small but significant, statistically significant increase, it's going in the wrong direction, and I want to get on top of that sooner rather than later and get that back to at least 0.95 or below if I can, obviously without affecting muscle mass, as creatinine can be, is proportional to muscle mass. What I'd also like to point out are neutrophil levels for a couple of tests in 2023. They were less than 2,000. And note that neutrophils less than 2,000 is associated with an increased risk of death for all causes. So I'd, I want to be in the 2,000 to 3,000 range. And with this test, I am back just barely into the 2,000 range, which is exactly where I want to, want to be, just above 2,000 as neutrophils increase during aging and relatively higher levels, again, are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. Now, there were other tests that I also measured that I don't yet have data for, but that data should be coming in very soon, including free testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin. So once that data comes in, expect to see a video on the channel about that. And on the same day as this test, I also sent blood for NAD, epigenetic and telomere testing, and metabolomics. So expect upcoming videos on all of those uh, topics and data breakdown. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for at, uh, epigenetic and telomere testing, NAD quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home metabolomics, which I almost said first, but... It's in, it's in a different order today. At-home blood testing with CyFox Health, including ApoB, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me a Coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.